Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back. Welcome back to the Music Money Makeover Show. Um, I got a couple announcements of this show. I wanna, I wanna let everybody know that this is probably going to be the last show that I actually live stream, right? But the rest of the shows will be on live stream. We're just gonna do a little pre-production for the shows because we got some really cool, fun stuff coming up um, really soon for the show and 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 giving it a little bit of an expansion. So everybody come on into the room. Welcome back. This is episode uh, episode 14, I believe, by the way. So we're racking them up, man. You know, I've been putting in the time. So I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that everybody's been taking in the information that I've been giving and been using it amongst yourselves to better yourself in your music career. All right. As usual, you all can follow me on Instagram at Casey Graham underscore 24 and on Facebook at Casey Graham and uh, so forth and so on. All right. And then you also can follow me on Facebook and LinkedIn just under Casey Graham. All right. All right. So let's jump into it. Today, we're going to be talking about how technology disrupts the music industry and and seeing where the money comes from because I like to equate markets to things like the real estate market, right? When a crash happened, those that usually have the capital can capitalize on these situations. So I got three things. I'm going back to 1909 and we'll start there, all right? But I'm gonna go from 1909 to, what about 1923? And then I'm gonna jump all the way to the 70s. And these three examples will show you what to look out for when something is coming into the marketplace so you can hop on it and say, all right, it's time to make some money in this music industry because this is where the money is made. It's usually something that's happening that people aren't paying attention to, okay? So let me hop into this. We're gonna jump right in and you all can check these notes out after the show is over, all right? So how did we get here? This is a little, this is, I kind of write these things like papers, by the way, because I do so much research, all right? In 1897, a man by the name of Adam Gabiel, I'm going to, I'm going to pronounce his name like that, wrote two songs, all right? He sold the copyright in his songs to the White Smith Music Company, which published the original sheet music, all right? So if you can follow me there, this publishing company published sheet music, like, I don't have that song book on me, but... They published the sheet music, all right? Another uh, co- company called the Apollo Company was in the business of manufacturing player piano rolls. So if you ever watch cartoons and you see Bugs Bunny walk into a bar and you see the piano thing spinning, you know, that's what happened there, all right? So when this happens, they in turn take the sheet music and punch the sheet, the piano roll sheet that keeps, that turns the keys, all right? That turns and the keys play. They infringed on the copyright because they didn't get permission to put it in a piano player form. This in turn created a loophole because the record companies that were reproducing compositions from publishers, all right, uh, and records 1908 and prior did not have to pay anything for the use of the music that was manufactured on phonograph recordings. Long story short, composers could now choose who they want uh, to record their music for the first time or they will record uh, themselves for the first time, all right? So let's say, and I think like two weeks ago, I might've mentioned this on the show. If you go and you sign up with a record, no, this was like maybe five or six weeks ago. If you go and sign with a record label, they're gonna negotiate in your mechanical royalty, and I'm gonna get to that in a minute, all right? This mechanical royalty by law has to be paid by the record label, but if there is a reason that they can find that they can pay less, they will and this gave them the loophole to do so, all right? So because publishers and composers could choose who would record the song first, obviously there has to be a feed there, all right? So I'm gonna hold it right there, and I'm gonna jump in, because this is how the market starts to capitalize on this, okay? And when I explain these things, I'm gonna explain it as uh, from a capitalization point, the detriment, the law, and then the solution. So each one of these will have that. All right, so now let's jump into the compulsory license because this is what we're talking about here. All right, so, um, and welcome Instagram, you all uh, come on into the room. All right, a compulsory license is a license that means that you must issue 
a license to someone who wants to use your work, whether you like it or not. Now, I pulled this from all you need to know about the music business. Donald Passman is, is um, you know, he's, he's the way he words things in his book is kind of direct and funny sometimes. But that's true. You have to give the right to someone only after it's published. Now, where does, what, what does all this mean? What does this mean? All right. So it means you are only required to issue a compulsory license if the song is a non-dramatic musical work. That means the sheet music with the lyrics and the melody on it. And it has previously been recorded. And the previous recording has been distributed publicly in phono records. And the new recording doesn't change the basic melody or fundamental character of the song. And the new recording is only used, all right, in phono records. I don't know what's going on with Instagram. We can't get it going, so we'll toss it. So, when you're in a market where someone needs to have the right of first use, which would be the record companies at that time, then they have to pay this mechanical royalty or this fee to use the composition, all right? The record companies will now dictate what the market will pay. Check this out. Under the 1909 compulsory license law, composers could choose whether or not to allow recordings to be made of their works and could charge whatever. Mind that. I'm a, let me go back to the beginning of that. Under the 1909 compulsory license law, composers could choose whether or not to allow recordings to be made of their works and could charge whatever the market could and would bear for the first such recording and by charge, we mean the mechanical royalty plus an upfront fee. All right. So if the first person you're going to is the record label to cut your composition now and put it in a master recording, they can then say what the fee will be. You can charge them, but because they have the power, they can tell you how much they're actually going to be willing to pay. All right. So now the market bears that the label will only pay 75% of that fee. Okay, of mechanical royalties out to a new recording artist, which means if you are a full rate producer and you want at least the minimum statute, which is the law, the statute is just a short term for law or minimum legal amount, the artist will have to pay the additional mechanical royalty out of their budget. Now, the capitalization with this record label saw a great opportunity to create a decreased mechanical royalty that will be paid out to publishers. This in turn would create an invisible market rate. All right. They're saving money, which means they're initially they're skimping money right off the top. OK, this is in this is in 1909. All right. The detriment of this is the artist suffers as well as the publishers. But the law comes in and this is the law. They enact the law because the labels took a stand on what they would and would not do. OK, and the solution became the publishers made the artists pay the difference. All right. So the reason why people fight over this thing is because the government allotted it. The first use would be from the record label. The record label says, hey, we're not going to pay you your full rate because we want to keep as much money as we can and not pay you out. And by the way, this money is not paid net, it's paid gross. So they're going to skim off the top. And the publisher says, no, we own the song. You must pay us our full rate. But if the artist, they put the artist in the middle. And if the artist signs a three quarter deal or a 75% mechanical rate deal, then the publisher would then tell the artist, hey, you have to make this up. Now, why does this throw some confusion in there? A lot of times the recording artists did not sing their own songs and they still don't sing their own songs which is why they put this fee on the artist to make it up because if the artist is not recording their own songs and it came from the publisher, then it's totally okay for the label to pay the publisher, but the artist will have to pay back the difference to the label. All right. This is what happens when a loophole is in a law or something is going on in the industry where the technology makes an impact to where people lose money, all right? The impact, the technology was the player piano role. That was the technology, okay? 
And then it also was the phono record, the vinyl record that was coming in, all right? At the time it was on like a tin foil type of thing, but it was like a little round cylinder, but it was coming in and technologies were decreasing the money that the record labels were making. So there had to be a law enacted. So now, once we get over this hump here, we have another one two years prior to this becoming an issue in 1907, and it doesn't get handled until 1923. All right? Check this out. And we're talking about radio. As you can see, technology is moving so fast at a rapid pace. Because not even just after we got through with our first case, we run into the thing of radio. Now, the radio loophole is this. In 1907, Lee DeForest, an engineer from Western Electric, developed the Audion vacuum tube, which, which could amplify radio waves. Laws were put in place, weren't put in place, excuse me, until after 1923 in ASCAP versus WOR. All right, this is a radio station in New York. All right. Every time technology is created, we embrace it and we use it, but it always provides a capitalization loophole, detriment, and then a law. With radio at that time, record labels were losing money because there wasn't any laws in place to pay record labels. And to this day, and I have something coming up in news that will talk about the same thing. And to this day, radio stations do not pay record labels. They pay the performance uh, rights organizations, ASCAP, CSAC, BMI, all right? Radio is the technology. It made record sales plummet in the ni early 1910s, okay? Which means there had to be a law in place. Now, the people who were using radio, was used. they were using the music to, you know, get people to listen to advertisement. You can't do that, okay? You can't broadcast music and it makes money for you. There has to be something in place or a license fee paid for this, okay? The cap, capitalization. Entrepreneurs saw a great opportunity to advertise and promote their acts, all right? This is cool for the record label. This is also cool for the publishers, but there's a problem and they're losing money, all right? So the detriment record sales decline because more people are listening to records for free. Kind of sounds like streaming to me. But this is 19, this is 1910, 1909, 1910. Radio is out. People are listening to music for free. And it's making record sales decline. All right? History just repeats itself. So we need a law. We need a law and we need a license fee. But before that, you got to understand this capitalization was coming into play because businesses that have radio stations were running advertisement. They were making ad dollars on the free radio music. The same thing that Spotify was doing and is still in lawsuits for. Okay? This is why you got to watch when new technology comes out and somebody creates it, you got to jump on it fast if you're going to capitalize on it. Now, I, I work in the music industry as well. And I, I realized that these technologies come into play and they cause us uh, a, a, a great reason to lose revenue. But you also got to play smart because laws will be enacted down the road. So if you're getting in, get in early. This law that came into place for radio, it led to a counteractive measure taking, taken by and led by a young group called the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers, ASCAP, all right? ASCAP versus WOR, which was a department store that had a radio station in New York. And they all came in and they band together to fight this case, all right? At the time, radio stations were, were permitted to pay $500 a year to license the songs. Now, since then, songs haven't, the, the rate has increased since then, but you, you, we're talking about 1909, okay? All right, so now what's the solution? All the way back in 1897, Congress finally had seen fit to grant composers the exclusive right with limitations to publicly perform their songs. All right, that right was continued in, in the 1909 statute or the law, okay? But it was subject to an important limitation. 
a composer's rights only extended to the public performance for profit. But was the new radio industry really ready for profit? All right. Listeners did not have to pay directly to receive radio broadcasts. The revolution of radio all right, was that it was free to everyone who had a receiver. And in the 1920s, radio stations were just beginning to figure out how to make money by selling advertising. Sounds just like streaming to me. All right. So we have radio now. It's going to be a while before we get to our next piece of technology. But once it happens, then we're going to see a wave of things start to happen. It's just going to like a domino effect. And it happens really fast. But the time between 1932 and this next one, 1972, is what is that? 50 years. Okay. So check it out. We go from 1932 to the sound recording piracy loophole in 1972. 50 years later, now we got our vinyl records out. Everybody's happy and all this stuff. But before that, there wasn't a copyright for sound recordings. It was just for publishers. They didn't attack this until 1972. All right. So from 1906, when the first congressional hearing on sound recording copyrights was presented to Congress, piracy had not flooded the market enough yet. It was on its way. People were taking vinyl records and 45s and all this stuff and re-singing stuff onto the uh, to vinyl records and pressing them and just putting them out. There was no copyright on the sound recording. Okay. So it wasn't until the 1960s and into the early 70s that sound recording or tape piracy had hit an all time high. Okay. Record companies claimed that they would have have to raise prices on records if piracy continued to escalate, hurting the public and the record companies in the end. So in 1971, Congress passed the sound recording copyright law for all sound recordings made after February 15th, 1972. And this law affects the new Music Modernization Act that's out now that came into law in 2018. Now, a lot of this stuff may seem boring to you, but it's what provides you means to make money on your copyrights, all right? So, if you stick with me, 1972 happens. Everybody's taking vinyl records, they're recording it onto their real reels because we didn't have they didn't have cassette tapes out just yet. They were coming. They were in the late seventies, but they were on the way. And people were just recording stuff, re-recording, repressing. No copyright at all. You could do whatever you wanted to do. All right. Now, digital sound recordings come in in 1992, and that's another 20 years later. The gaps are starting to get smaller and smaller when it comes to new technologies coming into play. So 1979, CDs come out, new technology emerges within the 10 year vinyl record, right? Emerges within 10 years, the vinyl record is pretty much obsolete. 15 years later, the piracy again, which will cause laws to change, which brings about the capitalization, all right? The industry made the consumer pay a high premium for the CDs. We're at the CD era now, up to $20. Record companies resold old albums in the new format. The detriment of this was slowing sales on vinyl records. Piracy rapidly increased. When the radio was introduced, record sales decreased, all right? When we had people making the piano rolls for the automated player pianos, the publisher lost money. You got to lose money first before there can be a capitalization. There has to be a crash before you have a cap. All right. So let's get back to our CDs. All right. The law came into place with this chip protection devices, preventing multiple copies. All right. Didn't work, but whatever. They also charge $8 fees for every digital recording machine and 3% of the price. It didn't last long. Okay? Didn't last long at all. Because the next thing you have coming out after the CDs are over with is streaming. All right? So streaming is so 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 if you can follow me and I'll go back to the top. 
You have 1909, 1897 to 1909. And then we pass a bill for the player pianos and the publishers. We go from 1909 to 1923 and we have another bill for the radio broadcasters. And then we go from 1923 to 1972 and we have finally our first sound recording copyright law. And then we go from 1972 to 1992 and CDs hit the market and there must be a law for it again. All right. And then on, because the, re and the reason why the CD, the 1992 digital sound recording law came into place was because people were recording CDs on cassette tapes. So now they're losing money for piracy again. All right. But here's a funny thing at the CD era, the solution was none because streaming was right around the corner. All right. We're in 1992, 1995. There's another amendment, digital transmissions over the internet. Then in 1998, webcasting. Then in 2008, ringtones. Then in 2018, streaming royalty increases. Technology is happening so fast that you have to look for the little nuances in between, okay? So, as you can see, each time there is a new technology that brings about a decline in sales to an industry, there is a small gap in the time the technology comes out, about the time it takes Congress to make a law for its uses, and that is the time in which a huge amount of capital is made in the music industry or any industry for that matter. So you got to keep your ear to the streets. All right. So I wanted to go through that because there's a couple things that came up in the news. I know I know it's kind of short, but I, I say all that to say this. TikTok. TikTok is like technology within technology. OK. And there is a, a license battle going on with TikTok that nobody is really like they're addressing it. But TikTok will be over by the time it's addressed. And I feel that Instagram will pick up what TikTok has already done by way of what came out in the news. Uh, I want to say yet yeah, today. All right. Instagram clones TikTok. Now, I said it was coming. Facebook had already did it. When they do it, they don't do it in, United, in the United States. They do it over in South America for some strange reason. Instagram clones TikTok with reels. There is no money being paid to the record companies, which means they're losing money. This is a new technology. So the app, the, pe the people who created the app can make money from advertisement, which they already are. That's illegal. You cannot use people's copyrights to make money. All right. That's why laws are in place. So they have to license this stuff. All right. It's going to boil down to what is this license going to entail and how much is going to be paid. So you're going to have to take an L to get a W. You must take a loss if you own copyrights to get a W. So utilizing the TikTok technology or the new Instagram technology called Reels, you're going to want to use that for promotion of your stuff by putting it in the stories or that this new or TikTok however it is to promote it so people will go listen to it. So you'll take a loss because the public is on the free wave and you're riding that free wave to advertise so people can go listen to your music. So by the time the law kicks in, it might be a little late for TikTok and how you're going to make money. But if TikTok can survive or this new type of way of sharing information survives this is another way to make money hopefully the law will come into place in time enough for it to be of great benefit to everybody right now no one is getting paid for music being shared on stories yet you should be getting paid that's almost up to 60 what i think story is like 15 seconds i feel like that's enough right now laws are in place to say that 60 seconds it will will Put it this way. That's what people program on. 60 seconds counts as a stream. Okay. So how does this new technology feed in to other things that's happening? So we have TikTok as a new technology and it's only based upon the smartphone and apps within it. So we have to dig into what's going to happen 
within social media and within these technologies. The smartphone bought about streaming, all right? And streaming was already there through companies like Napster, Rhapsody, E-Music, and all this stuff, but people had to sit down at a computer to listen, and it was just too much of a headache, but smartphones really took it out there with streaming, all right? So, let's go take a, uh, take a, uh, a look at um, another issue with technology. Remember when I was talking about the radio law, with the new law, with the Music uh, Modernization Act, we have radio broadcasters um, that are now coming to the table, all right? So the National Association of Broadcasters, DIMA, and dozens of other organizations are demanding the creation of a far more comprehensive music rights database. And this comes on because of the MLC that's in the MMA. Now, I know that's a little confusing, but... I'm just giving it to you. I'm letting you know that these laws are getting put in place so that you, the artist, you, the publisher, you, the indie record label, know where to make your money. That's the whole reason why I do this show. It's for that reason, okay? So I'm looking at this, and we're and, and, and just for this show only, we're looking for new technologies. New technologies, all right? Here's another one. Spotify taps Viacom in a major global content marketing deal. The question would be, what type of content? Because Spotify has been has been buying up stuff for a while, all right? Spotify has contracted the marketing department of Viacom to create programming, influencer content, and custom content for the streaming company. So if you keep your ear to the streets, you're going to know when this stuff happens. Why would they want to do this? Because there's so much content being created online that they need a production company or a television company or entertainment company to help produce more content to keep more people on the platform. That means more money. All right. I'm going to dig into this a little bit. All right. The unusual venture will cover many different markets that span Europe, the Middle East, North America, Latin America, and the Asia, Asia Pacific global regions. The two companies have not provided financial details about the joint venture as of yet. The deal was first tipped by DigiDay. I can tell you right now, they're swiping people up online to bring their shows to a paid platform on Spotify. Spotify is very dangerous when it comes to acquisitions. They're very happy-go-lucky right now, okay? So we got to look out for what Spotify is doing. Keep your ear to the streets. Video podcasts, audio podcasts, all of this stuff will soon become household, all right? Podcasts are not household things yet. They're right on the verge, and everybody's getting on board for the fear of missing out. So you want to keep your ear to the streets. TikTok is mainly that new technology that everybody is looking at right now. What I want to get into is what will be coming in the future. There has to be enough of a disruption in the marketplace to cause a substantial amount of money to be lost. And when money is lost in the music marketplace, you have to jump on that technology. Now, uh... A guy that I know here in Atlanta, a real old school guy, real kind guy, said something. Uh, Alan Johnson, shout out to Alan, was that eventually you're going to have these things embedded in your head or in your AirPods. They're getting you ready for it. So you're going to either have the Google Glasses that they like. I don't know if they're still out. The Google Glass where like a, something will beam inside your head. Believe it or not, I give it 20 years and they're ready. They will implement this because everybody's already wearing AirPods, all right? So this stuff will just come to you. And this is a new technology that can bring different means of audio to you, all right? So we're gonna see where this goes. But first, you have to look for the infringement and the decline of revenue. There has to be an infringement first. Once the infringement happens, Watch for the decline in revenue. If there is not enough decline in revenue, that means the technology won't last long, okay? And, and, and I can't go through it enough. Infringement, then you look for the drop in revenue. That lets you know the technology will last. 
And then from there is capitalization. Capitalization is happening when the record companies start losing money. That's when you cap on it. You cap on that technology. So when the law comes in place, you're already ready to go. All right. So anyway, you all, I know the show has been kind of short today, but I just wanted to bring these things to your attention. Like that's, that's, that's pretty much it because news was kind of slow this week. Also, if you all have released songs on Spotify before 2017, you might want to go and get some of that class action lawsuit money that they have out there. So go tell Spotify um, that, that yes, you did have some music released before 2017 and go get some money because they really, these lawsuits are coming because people aren't getting paid because registration isn't done. So make sure you go do that. All right, look, everybody, that's been the show. I know it's short, I know it's short, but that's that's the show today. Hey, if you want to have your music considered for television and film, please submit music to district24music.com slash submit, okay? If anybody needs consultations, that's up now. So you can go to the website, district24music.com slash consultations, okay? And you can follow me on Instagram at CaseyGram underscore 24 or at District 24 Music. You can follow me on Facebook at Casey Graham and LinkedIn at Casey Graham. All right, everybody, the show has been short, I know. But look, I will be back next week in new form. Hopefully we'll have some new things going on. All right. So until then, I will see you next week. Peace.